Well, good morning, good day, everybody. Uh, it's right at the top of the hour. We're going to get started today with the IndieSoft webinar covering remote asset management. Uh, my name is Scott Cortier. Uh, I'm with IndieSoft, and today we're going to have a very special guest, uh, Mr. Mike Odell with uh, Five Star Measurement, and he's going to be presenting to you the solution that uh, he has created for uh, doing remote asset management. Uh, before we get started, uh, with, with Michael's part, uh, I'm going to go over a little bit about IndieSoft uh, and some of the features that are really related to remote asset management. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of these features, but I'm just going to uh, make you aware of, of what these features are and how they relate to uh, remote asset management. And then I'll let Michael uh, uh, do his thing with uh, uh, showing you how he's implemented a remote asset management um, project using IndieSoft Web Studio. Uh, let's get started here. Uh, for those of you who are new to our webinar series, first of all, thank you for joining. For those of you who have joined multiple times, thank you also. But uh, uh, what I wanted to make you aware of is that uh, we can't hear you, so that if you, have, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, at the tail end of the presentation, we will be answering any questions that you may have. Um, again, we can't hear you. So if you look on your uh, WebEx window, either up at the top, uh, uh, there's a, you'll find a chat window or a questions and answer panel. Uh, please enter your questions in there, and uh, at the end of the presentation, Michael and I will try to answer your questions. Um, so let's get going on uh, IndieSoft. Um, what is IndieSoft company-wise? Uh, we started in 1997. We were established in the United States, uh, so we've been around quite a while. Uh, we have over 250,000 installations of IndieSoft uh, worldwide. Uh, we were a pioneer in the industry for the first to have really HMI and SCADA for uh, Windows CE. Because of the, the architecture of, of being able to develop for an embedded platform like Windows CE, we've been able to keep the product at a small footprint very efficient uh, and very fast uh, for that matter. So uh, that's of benefit to you. We also have, uh, we were the first to have a web solution and XML integration built into an HMI and SCADA platform. And we have a patent for database connectivity. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that when we get to our, our database section. We're a Microsoft Gold uh, certified partner, and uh, we've been an OPC Foundation member since uh, 1998. And you'll see uh, some OPC uh, built into this uh, project that Michael's going to show you here as well. Uh, we, recently, we were, uh, uh, we've won the 2013 Engineer's Choice uh, Awards for Control Engineering Magazine Reader's Choice, uh, and what uh, their Engineer's Choice, I should say, and that's by their readership. And um, really what that is is for three different products this year, IndieSoft Web Studio itself, uh, our Business Intelligence Dashboard, which I'll show you a slide uh, right before I hand it over to Michael, and uh, for our mobile access product as well. So we're pretty proud of that because that comes from the readership, not from the magazine itself. Now let's um, jump into IndieSoft uh, Web Studio Communications. And uh, first of all, hopefully everybody that's joined us today knows that IndieSoft Web Studio is, is not only an HMI package, but a SCADA package. This uh, can be used also as a supervisory type tool and data data collection and, and monitoring uh, kind of above the HMI uh, level. Uh, this slide here shows IndieSoft Web Studio, the product, in the middle of uh, these outside rings here. And, and what these are showing you is that IndieSoft Web Studio at the core uh, can communicate to uh, a lot of different devices in a lot of different uh, ways with a lot of open technologies. And what you'll see here is maybe the primary way that IndieSoft communicates is, is via um, uh, the over 240 drivers that we have built into the product. Those are included. Uh, there's just a, a handful of those that are not in the product, but uh, we have drivers for, you name it, everything from Omron, Mitsubishi, Allen Bradley, Siemens, GE, uh, the list goes on and on and on. The, the handful that we don't have that are built into the product are for some very specialized protocols, uh, for example, energy and, and power for DNP3 and some of the IEC protocols. Uh, some things like that. But most of the protocols for PLCs we have built into the product. In addition to uh, the built-in drivers, let's say, for example, we don't have a driver uh, that uh, you need for your particular device, then you can use OPC uh, to communicate to those devices. And we have 
not only what's what's typically known as OPC Classic, um, but OPC UA, .NET, and XML. Uh, and I'll show you uh, some of those in a different slide as well. We can also communicate via web and XML, uh, TCP IP server, and not only can we be a client for OPC, but we can be a server for OPC, so we can get information into other people's OPC clients as well. Um, database connectivity, and uh, I have a, another slide talking about database connectivity, but we can really connect to any uh, SQL relational type database, historians, uh, even uh, uh, Excel, uh, Microsoft Excel, and Microsoft Access, even though those aren't really truly databases per se. And uh, for those of you who need something just a little bit more, we have the capability to open up our API, uh, and we have your driver toolkits uh, that will get you to our, our database, our tag database, as well as uh, drivers. But the key point here that I want to point out, and, and really where this comes into play in, in uh, remote asset management, is the fact that, that IndieSoft Web Studio here is acting like a, a communications gateway. We can pull information from drivers, from devices, from OPC, uh, from the web, and use, use IndieSoft Web Studio to communicate uh, between these devices or share information from a device to a database or from a database through OPC uh, out to a device. So when you're really thinking about the connectivity that, that uh, uh, IndieSoft Web Studio brings, I, I, take a look at how it can work with this remote asset management through TCP IP, through remote connection, through OPC, uh, could be miles away, could be uh, you know, halfway across the world for that matter. As long as you have a TCP IP connection or some remote connection via one of these mechanisms, uh, then you can get the information back into IndieSoft Web Studio in and out of a database and use it that way. Um, the cloud comes into play uh, when you're talking about remote asset management, or can, uh, and, and some typical ways that this is, is used is you might have devices, uh, in Michael's case I think there's RTUs out there, uh, but again, any uh, TCP IP connection, and I'll talk a bit about this in another slide, but this connection to get information up into uh, into Soft Web Studio running in the cloud, let's say, or, or the, the database hosted in the cloud, that connection can be either via a physical, uh, let's say, Ethernet drop. Uh, it doesn't have to be. It could be through a dial-up connection. could be through a video modem. could be through a cell uh, modem. Uh, could be through a satellite connection. Uh, a lot of different ways uh, that you can get that information uh, back to uh, the cloud-hosted uh, project. And then via thin clients or, or uh, other mechanisms, you can get at that uh, information remotely. And this is really uh, what this is all about. It's getting the information remotely and, and having uh, access to it to globally, for that matter, and, and allowing the uh, people that need the information to get the information regardless of, of their regardless of their location or where they're at. Um, something that comes into play is security. Uh, IndieSoft Web Studio has is really three different, uh, kind of four different modes of security. We have the local uh, type security built in. We have what we call distributed server and client, which is similar to the local only, but uh, what it does is, is gives you the ability to, on one IndieSoft workstation, act as this kind of the security server, and all the other clients uh, get their security information from uh, that server. Uh, then we can also support domain-based security, or LDAP, uh, which for those of you who might not be familiar with LDAP, it's really the way that uh, uh, Microsoft Active Directory, and when you log on to your computer, if you're a Windows-based system and you're logging on to a domain, uh, it uses that information as well. So we can, we can tap into that and uh, get uh, the security from the Microsoft Active Directory as well. Um, something uh, that I need to mention, a, a lot of the topics that we're going to cover today are in previous webinars, and I know we have several webinars on security and security systems, so please feel free to go back and, and take a look at those free online videos on our website, uh, on our YouTube channel, and um, get some information about security. Also something I'd like to point out is we have uh, capability for our WebFin clients uh, to use HTTPS, uh, which is through port, uh, I want to say it's port 443. Uh, be able to do the uh, secure socket uh, connection, the SSL, through um, the, the connection to the WebFin client. So that's another opportunity that, that uh, you have to get secure information through there. Uh, I'll talk briefly about OPC and um, 
what we can do there. We have a lot of different OPC features uh, built in, as I mentioned in one of the first slides. We've been an OPC Foundation member since 1998. We're an active uh, member. We go to uh, a lot of the, the uh, meetings that they have, a lot of the, the seminars that they put on, and uh, even I think next week or the week after, we're going to uh, an interoperability festival that the OPC Foundation hosts where vendors like ourselves and uh, other customers that uh, uh, are involved with OPC literally come into a room. There's tables everywhere. We connect to each other's devices, make sure that we can talk. We test out each other's uh, software. We test out each other's connections. And uh, we test uh, the OPC Foundation specifications. And uh, we all learn from it. We all improve our connections to OPC. We improve the specification. Um, but what uh, a lot of you may not realize or know is that there are now many different flavors uh, of OPC. In the past, uh, when you said OPC, it was just assumed that you were talking about OPC VA. Uh, now the OPC Foundation is calling that OPC Classic. And um, what that uses is a um, Windows uh, communications technology called COM and DCOM uh, to communicate. And therefore, OPC DA has, has primarily been on a Windows platform. Um, if we take a step down here uh, to OPC UA, uh, that's a, a relatively new uh, technology. It's been out for, for quite a while, surprisingly long time. But uh, in, in um, the way that it communicates, it does not use COM and DCOM at all. Uh, it uses, uh, uses other communications technologies that are not based only on Windows uh, uh, communication technologies, so it can be on any operating system, on any platform. And you'll see, and, and Michael uh, hopefully will mention this when we get to your, your part of the presentation, that um, OPC UA is, is what Michael's using to get some information from the field. Um, we also have built into the product uh, this last one here, which is OPC.net. And as a communications technology, it uses Windows Communication Foundation. So OPC.net has to be on a Windows platform. Um, very similar to OPC DA, uh, but now uh, it can be used uh, using newer communications uh, technologies. And last but not least, uh, there is uh, another technology the o that OPC has called OPC XML, and uh, we have that as part of the IndieSoft Web Studio, but that, that particular one happens to be an add-on, one of the very few add-ons that we have uh, within IndieSoft Web Studio. Uh, but the basic idea is you can almost think of, of an OPC server as a, as a translator where there may be some type of communications to some field device or uh, some controller that you have, and the OPC server then communicates and then turns that into OPC communications, which as an OPC client, we can then understand. So it doesn't matter what's on the other side of the OPC server. As long as we can talk to the OPC server, we understand it, and we can get the information in and out. Um, so that's, that's a, a very big benefit of OPC is, is uh, that standardized communications there. Uh, okay, so let's talk briefly uh, about our database uh, connectivity. And this is uh, really a big part of the remote asset management. Um, first of all, IndieSoft Web Studio is um, very easy to use when it comes to communicating to uh, databases. We have uh, built into some of the objects, uh, particularly our alarm, our history, the trend history, uh, some process data, some more information. We have uh, built into those objects or those worksheets, we have a way to basically via drag and drop, uh, menu fill in the blank, uh, you're communicating to a database without knowing any uh, SQL command, uh, any um, uh, programming in SQL uh, at all. So basically you tell it, uh, I want to log this data, here's the database that I want to go to, here's my security, and uh, away it goes without knowing any uh, SQL statements at all. Um, we have built into the product, if you know SQL and want to get advanced, we have the ability to do some really uh, in-depth, uh, any, any type SQL commands uh, that you want. I'll show you a bit about that uh, here in a minute and I'll show you a little bit about how that's formatted. Uh, but we can really uh, communicate to any, um, any database that uses SQL, and, and there's a lot of them. Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, Oracle, Sybase, FoxPro, uh, OSI, Pi, Historian, and we can even treat uh, Microsoft Access and Excel as databases and, and communicate with those as well. Uh, of course, Excel is not a database. Uh, Microsoft Access, if you're 
if you're using a lot of data, I would highly suggest not using Microsoft Access because it gets slower the, the, the larger the database gets. For those of you who are not aware, Microsoft SQL Server has uh, Express editions. There's uh, SQL Server 2008 Express, and now there's even 2012 Express. Uh, those are free and can store up to 10 gigabytes of data. So uh, for those of you who have some small to mid-sized applications and want to get some data uh, and we're uh, concerned about the cost of a, a database, Microsoft SQL Server Express is, uh, is free to use. Um, we use standard technologies when we're communicating to these databases. And setting up and communicating with those those databases is is, is pretty easy, and um, built into the product. And again, this is a, along the lines of of what Indusoft has as a as a running theme throughout um, our product and our viewpoint is to have everything included within Indusoft Web Studio, everything that you need uh, to create an HMI or a SCADA application, including the redundancy and store and forward uh, features when we're talking about databases. So uh, we can do that. Um, what uh, is you know what do we use databases for when we're talking about remote asset management? We're talking about collecting information from each asset in the field, regardless of where it is, saving it and getting that information into a database, and being able to present that information in a clear and useful format, whether it be filtered or sorted, uh, or the only the information that that particular person needs to see about those particular assets, uh, it gives them opportunity to, to, to see that and use that. Uh, what is remote asset management? Um, you know, really what we're talking about is having uh, devices or things in the field that uh, um, we want to get the information out of, but we don't necessarily want to physically go to each device and either write down a reading uh, or physically drive to the location and understand what's going on. Uh, and really what this comes down to is factors of labor and time. The time that it takes us to get to that equipment or those devices, the, the personnel and people that it would take to uh, drive there, physically walk there. Um, you know, I've, I've personally been in some facilities that uh, are millions of square feet and uh, it takes you a half an hour to walk to any location. And uh, that's that's time that could be better spent uh, elsewhere, you know. And, and and even in a field application, a process application, where we're talking about pipelines and and process facilities that are that are extremely huge, uh, you don't want people walking all over uh, and driving golf carts and getting there to uh, to read that information. So, where can this be used? Um, you know, Michael's uh, application is related to meters, and uh, he can explain a little bit more on that, but. Some of the things where we could be using this is uh, building automation and facilities management, uh, government and utilities where, where utility uh, you know, substations and drops might be uh, uh, miles apart, um, you know, could be wind turbines, uh, things of that nature. Manufacturing facilities, of course, where you have a larger facilities. Transportation, uh, you know, I'll talk briefly about fleet management. Uh, asset management doesn't necessarily mean just reading meters and valves and, and remote statuses. We could be talking about monitoring um, trucks and railroad cars and things of that nature and where they're at. And of course, oil and gas and process type applications as, as Michael will show you as, as well there. <clears throat> so uh, remote asset management is a very similar diagram that I had shown before where you have devices or, or whatever assets uh, out in the field. And I've drawn these just as simple rectangles because I don't know what devices you're going to be monitoring. They could be, again, meters, valves, pumps, and you could be monitoring their serial numbers, their flow rates, their uh, based on unique IDs. You might not even know what those devices are, but uh, have a unique uh, identifier associated with them. And when we're talking about fleet management, it could be trucks, could be semi-trucks, could be um, um, vans that are, are delivering expedited materials or rail cars. Uh, you know, you know, how much does a, a railroad car cost, and then where is that uh, current rail car sitting in a in a yard somewhere, uh, off in the corner, and it's it's lost at that point. So hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of material lost because uh, you don't know where it is. While well, using satellite connections and GPS, uh, uh, it's a pretty small cost when you're talking about the overall picture thing. Construction equipment, you know, some of these construction uh, projects have lots of equipment, and and where are they located? Uh, are they on this job site or on that job site and, and the, the logistics behind all of that. So and of course, uh, you know, kind of what Michael is going to show you, the meters and the flow rates and things of that nature, um, we, can, we can dive into those as well. So getting that information 
up into uh, a database and then being able to deliver it uh, via thin clients or via other applications that could be web-based, uh, wherever you need that to get that information to. Um, when we're talking about maintenance, uh, there's really kind of three phases to this. And we could be talking about monitoring only, just looking at the device and reading it and storing that information. We could take it another step and do preventative maintenance. Uh, again, it goes back to that time and labor. If, uh, if you know a device is going to go out, schedule its, its repair. Um, you know, if you, if you look at this and say, oh, it's been running for X number of, of days or hours or years, and it only has a life expectancy of such, uh, replace it when it's convenient for you as opposed to uh, in a downtime situation when uh, uh, it's, it's most critical and you need it most. Um, then we can take it on another step further and do predictive maintenance. And this is a little bit more advanced, but with the horsepower that we have now in the computers and the scripting languages, uh, you can take math uh, into this and do some really advanced uh, circumstances where, for example, if a pump is supposed to last, let's say, X number of years, uh, uh, under normal uh, conditions, but maybe it uh, uh, you take into account the load that it has or the external temperatures that it has and say, hey, wait a minute, this thing's being um, uh, over, overly tasked uh, and maybe it's not going to last its full life and uh, understand uh, those conditions that are uh, going to do that and replace it uh, before there's a problem. Um, really quickly, before we hand things over to Michael, I'm going to talk about the Business Intelligence Dashboard. And uh, it's an add-on toolkit, uh, not a toolkit, it's a uh, product that we offer that is really drag and drop to be able to create some nice dashboards that could be charts, uh, graphs, Paredos. And basically what it is is it, it reads database and it takes the raw data that has been put into a, a, a database and you can get meaningful information out of it. Stop guessing what's happening in the field and, and really relying on, on the raw data. And how does this work? Um, briefly, it basically connects to any uh, SQL uh, database or even uh, Microsoft Access. And there's a configuration wizard basically with just a few mouse clicks. You tell it what database you want to, what table you want to go to, and using built-in security, uh, you can then visualize those dashboards uh, on different devices. It could be PCs, tablets, smartphones. And then you can save those as PDF reports or, or send them directly to uh, a printer as well. So uh, again, take the guesswork out of it and, and, and get the information uh, where you need it. And, and this can tie into the rural and asset management uh, because some of the charts that we can have uh, can tie into those uh, individual assets. So Michael, I'm going to uh, uh, try to hand things over to you as a presenter here. So Okay, there we go. You, uh, you are now the uh, presenter, so if you would, go ahead and share your desktop and uh, take things away. Uh, I can hear you just fine. Hopefully, uh, everybody else can as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Michael Odell with Five Star Measurement, and uh, we'd like to talk to you about asset management and the things that we do now. A little bit about Five Star is that uh, we do SCADA hosting. Uh, we do real-time data, reporting, uh, Custom reports, volume reports, monthly, uh, daily, uh, also consulting, alarm notifications, uh, trending. Uh, you can have custom trending set up for you also, and controls. And Five Star also does uh, installations, uh, flow computer, meter runs, scattered applications, uh, and communications. If it can be wired, we probably install it. So uh, maintenance. Calibrations, gas analysis. Our guys actually got the GC in the truck, so you can you can get your analysis in the field. You don't have to wait for uh, the lab, or you can get it on site. Witnessing, we do break fix, audits, and consulting. Remote asset management, uh, is monitoring, data collection, uh, alarms, and trending, and uh, reports. And monitoring, we're monitoring mainly the the uh, flow, you know, batteries. Uh, if a battery drops below 10.5 on a lot of the meters, it will stop measuring gas or the radios will quit uh, talking so we can tell if we need to get batteries replaced or we can look for no flow with volume um, and, uh, and alarms. Hopefully we, uh, an alarms with no flow, uh, a field engineer can be alerted to get out there and, and uh, give that, that well some attention. Uh, trending. Trending helps us when you got alarms basically for batteries too because just because the you got a low battery 
sometimes just because of sunlight and a solar panel out there, uh, you can see the trend of the batteries going down or if it's going back up when the sun comes up or uh, if you got some more, if you can get a few more days out of it. Um, now, most of the things we, we talk to are the uh, serial devices. Uh, the assets we, we, we monitor are tubing and casing on the wellhead, uh, separators, uh, tanks, uh, the meter, so the flow, temperature. Uh, the RTU has, the, has a battery a modem and a radio and a solar panel on it. This RTU will be wired or wireless to talk to devices. We'll wire them up to the devices in the field. Uh, there's the separator. We wire up to the tanks and the meter. The RTU will collect uh, the data. Uh, we will use the application to poll the meter, and we can poll. We have scheduled polls and instant polls using the UA OPC. And the remote to access, these meters in the field on this project mainly are the total flow and, and, the, and the Fisher Rock, and we have some skater packs on this one also. Sometimes the poll, you got to get a little passionate. Those days, you, you, the poll goes out on the, line, on the wire. The OPC will, con will communicate with the modem. The modem will talk to a uh, master serial radio. And when it, when it comes to serial communications, it's one-to-one -one ratio, so we can only talk to one device at a time on that port. So that's it's important for us when we're troubleshooting uh, you know, if you got 100 meters to pull on, on how you set up your network, so that you can get the most efficient poles. Now, that master serial radio is going to talk to another slave radio, which is installed in the RTU. And the RTU uh, again has the, the battery, solar panel, and, and the radio. Again, if the battery drops below a certain voltage, typically it will shut off communications and continue to measure gas so you can get a tech dispatched out there to uh, address the problem and get the battery replaced or what else is causing a problem, uh, solar panel, but at least allow them to get out there and troubleshoot the cause. As soon as it receives the message on the radio, it passes to the RTU. The RTU builds its response and, you know, back up the chain, and hopefully you got your information. Same thing, next one, polls. And... Uh, the Rock RTU will do the exact same thing. It'll, it'll, it'll re take the request, package its response back up, and reverse it back to the network through the serial radio, through the master serial radio, and to the modem. And this right, this this slide here is just a uh, a simple uh, demonstration. A lot of times we've got, uh, say, a router coming in with say four ports and uh, you know 200 meters. Or, 300 meters, and you've got the one-to-one -one ratio, meaning that you come in with the modem, come out the serial modem, and then to the slave. And if it's, if it's being passed to repeaters, you have to take that into account. Bad weather days, uh, that's just typical with the uh, serial network. Now, oil field doesn't shut down at 5 o'clock, 24-7 monitoring. To accomplish this, we, uh, we've done in-house development in the past, and we've uh, it's, it's tough to keep up with in-house development. I mean, you've got to become a, a software company or, or uh, an integrator, and, and we do so many different things at Five Star that we decided to, be, to focus on integration and uh, looked around at the different options out there and uh, decided to, to weigh our options and... Uh, after exploring those options, we had to, uh, you know, discuss and, and decide what we wanted to do. And some factors was time and the money is a factor, a big factor. Um, when we looked at Indisoft uh, Web Studio, they had built-in security for the users, and uh, that that's a big factor as far as setting up uh, permissions and, and different users to be able to access different screens to save us time in our development. And another big plus that we liked was, I mean, they have over 200 drivers 
that we can use to communicate. Uh, multi-language was awesome. Uh, and so that just development time was, we like, this will help with our development time. Uh, scripting, they have um, <clears throat> IWS built-in scripting and VBScript built-in scripting. Um, the OPC UA client, I was so fond of the drivers, I listed it twice. Um, develop once and deploy on a Microsoft supported platform, including Windows, CE, mobile, XP embedded, and server additions. This was a, um, a big plus because you could, we could develop once and then put it on mobile. We could change it to, you know, if we had a, a project where we needed to put it on HMI or a touch screen, we could use similar projects to uh, <clears throat> make that move. Software toolbox, <clears throat> and uh, they have a product top server, which is what we're using on our OPC UA. Uh, Jim Wiles and Wynn, great guys. That was another factor in us deciding what we wanted. They supported and helped us on some projects, but especially for short notice. Uh, the other thing was uh, serial encapsulation. That that was a big factor we had to have. Most of our devices, like I said, are serial. Uh, and the EFM module was another factor that we needed. I mean, the EFM is we collect the hourly data and the daily data history. And then if you are, or if you cannot connect it, connect and collect that data, it, it keeps the last poll that you got. And when you go back to get that data, it would only bring back your missing data that you got. And that was very important to us. And again, the support was just uh, from the get go and to now, it's just, just excellent with them. So that's our decision. Obviously, was to team up with uh, Five Star and Software Toolbox and uh, OPC Foundation and uh, start our integration and, and not do everything in-house so much. This way we have sustainability to keep up with different versions. Uh, also, if you run into any, any issues with operating systems, we don't have to worry about that anymore because we had Indusoft and uh, Top Server. Here's a little slide on the architecture of our networks. The RTUs, as I was saying earlier, if you get 100 or 200 or, or you know, over the demo I'm going to show you with just a few. These are repeaters. And what you see is that if you have a radio out there, they repeat through some three or four different repeaters back before they get back to your um, to your modem or your router or T1. Um, the thin clients we can view on mobile devices, uh, most uh, an Explorer, a browser, and um, this gives us, a, again, great, Plus, where we can develop one time and, and put it on uh, a mobile device, tablets, or um, basically any device that you can get on the internet. The uh, the benefits, <clears throat> ability to monitor thousands of RTUs in real time and control the uh, polling based on a schedule and demand. That that was just that's a necessary. We have to have that for the asset management to be able to collect the data and to be able to trend the data and have it in the database. Um, so it was a great benefit. Uh, automated reports, that was important. We can look at that. The field field guys can look at it and say, you know, these are the wells I need to optimize, you know, the ultimate goal. And, and asset management is to uh, reduce uh, reduce cost and and uh, be efficient and, and increase the, the production. Here's a screenshot for the well status. Um, if you look at this, if everybody can see it, um, on this poll we got good. But what we'd be looking for under under the battery, say we got 12.9, 12.7, everything looks good there. Volume VGT, that's uh, volume gas today, and and VGY. Is a volume gas yesterday and the line pressure, otherwise, or static pressure, however you want to say it. Uh, the next one is differential pressure and the temperature, the gas temperature, tubing and casing. Let me get the next slide here. The no flow, this is a, a, a slide to show you for the no flow. If you look at the instant rate, that's what comes back with zeros. That means we got no flow on those meters and that they can sort this 
and, and get on those wells and give them the attention they need to um, get them back online. Also, let's see. It's on the next one. Low batteries. Here we go. If you see, we got 11, 7, 11, 7, the 11 11.3, 10, 5. 10, 5 is usually our alarm. Well, 10, 9 to 10, 5 uh, to start alarming to look into that, in that battery. But uh, again, using the trends and knowing uh, during the daylight hours, if, you know, depends on where you are in, you, in the world. If you have three hours of sunlight or five hours of sunlight or two hours of sunlight. Um, so we have to um, take in that when it's nighttime, you know, some of them will drop down. Um, hopefully uh, that's not the case, but at least we can look at this and use the trending in a minute. I'll show you that to, to find out. Here's the uh, historical analysis on a, on a table format. Also, there's a, a trend at the bottom of it uh, that you can see. The uh, Let me see what we got here. This is the trend for 50525, 506. This is trending. We also got trending where it will be either hourly or daily from the history that we collect. Volume edits. Uh, also, we have a feature where you can uh, edit the volume, uh, just like you would in some other gas editing uh, application. Uh, this one here, web-based configuration on the fly. We're able to change uh, the meter configuration without restarting anything. Uh, if you look down, you see the high limit, high, high limit, and high and low limit, and low, low limit. This allows you to set your alarms uh, for any, any, any I.O. you got. In this situation, we have up to 20. Uh, there's a list right here of 1 through 7 on this particular one. But if you want to add I.O., this is allowed to at least 20 per, per pad. And you can't do more. But that's just how we built that one. Uh, blogs and events. This is event. This is uh, very key when you got problems. You'll see here how this event is waking up, waking up. Uh, battery voltage 11, 9, 11, 7, 10, 9. This is a, this is a problem about to happen. So, um, this is where the events come in handy when you got issues. You can kind of, without driving out to the field, or many acres, as uh, Scott was saying earlier, uh, walking and looking at you know, time is money, and this is what helps. Uh, contact information, that's about what I got for the PowerPoint. Now, what I'd like to do is show you a demo. What I've got, a demo is, uh, let me get it loaded real quick. with me here. Okay. Right here is a, is a status poll, what we'd say, and you can see, you know, bad connect or good. It gives you the status of the poll of the device, and then you can re-poll the device if you want, if you'd like. Uh, to, you click on a device that you don't want to get a value and update on, and this is the instant rate. Uh, again, the volume gas today, volume gas yesterday, line pressure, and, and that's in the mornings. Like now, it's uh, roughly what's it, eight eight thirty nine. Field engineers, you know, five o'clock in the morning, they're already looking at this and deciding how they're going to plan their day and their routes. And it's important for them to be able to get instantaneous data in yesterday's volume and today's volume at the con at the contract hour. Um, the, from here. I'll initiate a poll. Right now we can say, you know, read three is, is uh, polling right now. I'm sorry. Uh, polling right now is uh, Mitchell Sales 2. And if we wanted to poll three, we'd click that poll button. It would put it in the queue because, it's, like I said earlier, the, the, um, the modem and the serial radio is shown on that slide. This is where it's important to have the, the OPC server and uh, to manage those connections because it can only take one poll at a time through that serial radio. And uh, if you try to poll more than one device on that one port, then it, it, it just will fail. So this allows us to manage that. Again, you can open up 
more ports and pull more devices. But this, this, this right here allows us to queue one up instead of just pulling it and getting a timeout. If an engineer needs it, it, he can just put himself in the queue, and as soon as it finishes that next pole, it will, it will grab it for them. Also, the trend details. Here's our trending. Now, it lists instant rate and all the values and IOs that we showed you earlier. It's here, and uh, if you want to take it off, I can I'll leave interest rate. You want the volume gas yesterday. Let's go ahead and let's take this everything off and let's look at a, a battery to see what's going on. Now, this one has the ESD. Uh, we'll leave the tank for right now. Take the separator off. Casing and tubing. Uh, gas temp just to make it a little cleaner. And differential pressure. So we'll leave line pressure there. I'm remoted into a box, so it's a little distorted. I uh, apologize if it's, the lines are distorted. They're typically not. Let's see. Let's get rid of the instant rate, too, right now. And for the battery, you can you can pick any uh, color or however you want to do. Just click the trending. And for the battery, let's see if this stands out. You can see where the battery drops off through the night and the day. We're just, oh. So that's a handy tool. We go back to our, our status. And we got a, these, these, these wells right here during the, are being worked on. And, and sometimes on, when they're not online, sometimes they're online. So that's why we're seeing a lot of bad connects right here. Now, uh, another status view we have is right here. So, and it's all kind of which one you want, personal preference. Um, trending. You can trend from also from the, the other status pole with the, with the satellite symbol. Uh, alarms. The alarms here or for alarms that are actually in the RTU. The RTUs have their own alarms that they're set up. Uh, some are, some aren't. And you can collect the alarm. So when we, when we do a poll, especially with the, the OPC UA, we can collect the history, the events, the alarms, and also hourly data or daily data. The DFM history just allows us to grab all that information. And, that, and that's, that comes in handy. It's, now the logs, as earlier as a shot I showed you, was events that would collect. This one here just doesn't have any vents in it uh, collected. That's, that's a good thing we had a, a uh, slide with that. Now, under the reports, we have monthly reports, missing records, uh, and, uh, and you can export uh, and download your reports from here, and you can search for the reports uh, you know, by month. Um, missing records. Uh, we use that usually just internally, and for us to look at meters and say, hey, uh, it's not collecting daily, our history, or um, that's mainly what that is. It's no hourly records or daily records. Something's happened, and it's just not collecting. So it lets us know that we need to get out there and look at those meters. So here's an instance of these two uh, missing. 30, 29, and 17 days. Again, those meters... Of the, of the troublemakers. Um, now let's move to settings over here. Notifications. Let me find the polling. Let's get back to meter IO. Hold on one second. Clicked on a. Let me show you the status poll one more time. Let's see if we can. Okay, here we go. This is the history. I didn't show you this to you earlier that I was talking about. The EFM, the daily and the hourly history is, is, a, is a, how we collect that is through the EFM module on the OPC UA. Uh, daily, as you can see, it lists the 
daily. I mean, that's the history it collects. I mean, it's it's not the real time data. It's the it's the history. Uh, hourly is the hourly data. Now, there's don't have any collected on this one. Well, that's not true. Let's take a search today. Let's see what we get here. And we can pick a different meter. There we go. A meter is actually communicating. It helps. So here you can look at your hourly and your daily, and this is important for the volume reports and it reports for the end of the month, which is uh, you know you got to send to the railroad commission. The other status that is mainly used by the field engineers to uh, optimize uh, production. And um, they use that way more than the hourly or the daily. And, uh, but that's the alarms. Let me see if show you how to set the alarms up. Okay, the alarms right here. You would you would select instant rate, whatever you want the alarm. If you want a no flow off instant rate, you could use that. But let's use the battery uh, alarm you'd, on this one. You'd modify, and you'd be able to uh, set a high alarm, a low alarm, or low low alarm, and uh, just click apply. Then you've got an alarm set up. Now, earlier, there's the, the notification groups. You would set a notification group, and uh, you would put in all the, all the users. You just assign, you pick a meter, and you'd assign it to that group, and then you take the user you wanted, assign it to that group, and it would alert those users. Uh, meter I.O. earlier I said it was 20, and this particular one, there's the 20 being used. So we, you could change them however you wanted. You could click one, you could modify it, and change your I.O. on the fly to what you wanted to monitor. Let's see. What am I missing for you guys? I think that's... Um, that's, a, that's that's about it. I guess we can talk about what we want to do, do in the future. And as as he was saying earlier, uh, the predictive minutes we're collecting the data. We're able to trend the data to predict when there will be a problem and uh, send it out there before we're getting the uh, alarm or the alert, so we can have them changing out batteries or whatever makes sense to uh, to optimize the production. So um, I guess. Scott, uh, that's all I have right now. Can you hear Michael, me? thank you very much. I can hear you fine. Thank you. Um, great uh, deal of information. Really appreciate you joining and showing uh, showing everybody today. I'm going to I'm going to take back presentation status from you for a moment. Uh, as I'm doing that, uh, I'd like to tell everybody that uh, if you have a question, please feel free to put it into the uh, question and answer panel. Uh, and or the chat window, and we'll try to get uh, uh, those answered from you uh, as soon as we can or while we're, while we're here online. Um, let's see here. Let's see if I can't. Uh, the, the, hopefully everybody can see my screen okay. And what I'll do is I'll go back and share my desktop. And there we go. You should be able to see my PowerPoint again. And let's see if I could ask uh, somebody in our Austin office to go ahead and let me know if they can see everything okay there. Uh, and I'll bring up the Q&A. Um, while we're doing this, uh, I don't see any uh, uh, questions related to remote asset management. We do have one question in here. Uh, where can we get the software for Android uh, operating system? Um, one of the things that I'd like to show you is that you really don't need any special software for Android operating system. Uh, I have an application here that I'm going to show you in a moment, but here under Thin Clients, if you set up the mobile access, 
Uh, the mobile access is uh, the part that you can see on Android and uh, iPads and, and smartphones and things of that nature. So you really don't need to set anything extra up. You just set that up within the uh, software here under the mobile access. There is also a, uh, a demo online, and I'll bring this up off screen here and uh, bring this down into view in just a second. Um, if you go to our website, which is indusoft.com, and again, let me bring this here into view. Uh, if you go here under Demos, uh, Mobile Access, uh, you can log into the Mobile Access demo using these credentials here, and what you'll see is, is how to uh, view that or what you can see on the um, either a, a browser, a smartphone, a tablet, really anything with HTML5 capability. And what you have the ability to do is view and interact with uh, process values or tag values. You can see trends. You can see alarms. Uh, and you can get at, at that as well. So uh, you can also view the mobile access tabular information from there uh, as well. So um, what I wanted to show you, I, I, again, I don't see any questions. Feel free to put those in the questions and, and answers. Maybe Michael did just a superb job and, and nobody has any questions. Um, what I wanted to show you uh, with, without making uh, Michael dive into his actual source code uh, is an application that we have for um, monitoring and maintaining um, RFID badges. Um, so the, the, the idea here is we've used a grid object, which um, Michael has used a lot of in his application, and we have the ability to um, insert and, and uh, delete uh, RFID badges uh, from a database. And the way that this basically works is here under tasks uh, in a startup script, when this application uh, launches, what we do is we um, use this startup script and uh, the database connection here, and we, uh, if the database does not exist, we go ahead and create the database. If it already exists, uh, then we establish a connection to it. And then here on the screen, uh, within this uh, grid object itself, the grid object is connected to that database, and here under advanced, we're able to use uh, some tags coming from some of these buttons and from some of the script and we're able to then select the, the, the values and the rows and, and maintain uh, a view of this uh, uh, database record or this table by using this grid object and not really having to know any uh, SQL by using this at all. And when we uh, run this and take a look at this, I, I preloaded some information in here earlier. Um, the uh, RFID tag, so that might be a badge that you have, and, and essentially this could be like a, some type of remote asset, but I wanted to show you the, the grid object and the, the database connection. So here, if I want to insert a new RFID badge, this might be 987654, and then it might be assigned to uh, Bill Johnson. And you can see that that's now added into the database. Uh, this is actually using a, a Microsoft SQL uh, Server Express 2008 database. And if I wanted to select a record, here's, here's one that maybe I delete. It prompts you for that. This is all done via scripting. Um, and then I can, let's say I want to test a badge. Maybe somebody dropped a badge on the ground and we want to scan it and find out who it's associated with. Uh, so that comes back with ABC123. Uh, and when I scan that, you can see that, oh, that's associated with me, uh, and I, I dropped my badge, and we can get that back to the appropriate person and, and reprimand them for dropping the badge on the ground. But uh, this is a, a very uh, simple application that uses database connectivity. It uses the grid object. It uses uh, SQL. It uses uh, the built-in connections within the grid object. And you can see that, that within uh, Michael's application, he was using a lot of these same ideas and a lot of these same tools uh, if somebody wants this application, uh, maybe what we'll do is post it in the sample applications here in the next few days. Make it available so you can see how that's used, uh, and hopefully you got some ideas from uh, Michael's application and uh, what can be done with remote asset. Uh, we have a question here uh, in the application presentation, where and how is the data buffered and stored and forwarded? Um, Michael, uh, I'm going to ask you to answer this because I, I don't know exactly how your information is stored or where it's stored. I'm assuming it's uh, in some type of database. Uh, can you still hear me, Michael? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hello? Yep. Is your data is, where? Can you hear me? Okay. Is your data it, stored, stored in a in a database in a cloud or where is it? It is stored in a database in the cloud uh, in SQL. 
Okay. Uh, so that's off-site, and so all of that information goes from whatever your devices are, and you're collecting that information via OPC UA into IndieSoft Web Studio, and then IndieSoft is then forwarding it out to the database. Is that the way that works? Right. If it's an EFM or history poll, then we you know, read it in. It comes back as a in the, as a text file, and we read that text file into the database. If it's their status okay, so it's poll, just coming in as a CSV poll. file. Right, and we'll read that into the, the database. And so we have okay. to process each one of the history or daily polls. Now, this real-time data uh, is just logged to the database. We don't have to read that. Okay, so, great. Uh, another question that we have, let's see, is there a way that we can do auto-tasking uh, via IndieSoft by pulling information periodically for daily or monthly reports? Uh, yes, uh, actually, the... Uh, the ability to pull information uh, at whatever rate you choose is, is uh, uh, your, your choice. A couple of different ways that that, that can be accomplished. Uh, let's open up uh, an IndieSoft application here. Uh, via the uh, trend task, let's say, we can choose to log information to a database uh, uh, however we choose. We can do that. In this case, it defaults to once per second. You could set this up to once per minute, or you can base uh, put a tag name in here that you change uh, however you want that frequency to be. Uh, and one way to do that is we might put in a tag called trigger here, and that trigger does not exist. I might make that a Boolean type tag. And then here under the um, tasks, under the scheduler, uh, I would set up uh, a time or a frequency that I might want that to happen at. So this would be uh, hours, uh, minutes, let's say we want this to happen every 15 minutes and seconds, and I could then change a tag name based on uh, uh, an if statement, let that count up or let that um, toggle every 15 minutes, let's say, and put in trigger here, and do not trigger. And every 15 minutes that trigger tag would toggle, and that toggling mechanism would then toggle this uh, how to log the data. And you could use that same concept with this trigger to manage a script that would be uh, telling it when to log, uh, when to pull information, and or print reports. There is uh, reporting tools built into IndieSoft Web Studio here where you can build up a report, take a snapshot, and uh, uh, using the scripting within uh, built into IndieSoft Web Studio, you can use that to trigger when these reports would happen. That could be text, that could be uh, PDF type format, uh, uh, hypertext, so that could look like a web page, you know, lots of different formats. And as far as reports go, we can offer, uh, also we have a third party tool that we work with uh, called Dream Report. We just did a webinar on that uh, a couple of weeks ago. If you want uh, more information more information on how some of those reports work, you can, uh, you can take a look at those different webinars. A lot of the concepts that we have uh, presented here today, uh, the grid object, uh, database connections, OPC, uh, we have some dedicated webinars, uh, again, also on security. Uh, we've done some webinars uh, in the past that we have posted on our YouTube channel, on our website, uh, as well as we have uh, training videos uh, on our website. We have our full five-day training class on our website, so if you want to take a look at how to do specific functions and features, uh, that might be bits and pieces of, of what you're looking for. Maybe, maybe a lot of what Michael showed uh, in his application is, is relevant to you, but you want to do something a little bit different. Take a look at the training video for that particular uh, feature that you're looking at, and, and uh, hopefully that will help you get going. Uh, at this point, uh, I don't see any more questions. I would really like to thank uh, uh, our guest today, Mike. Uh, really enjoyed seeing what you guys have done. Uh, looks like a great application and, and saving a lot of time and money and walking to the field and, and monitoring these assets uh, remotely and uh, getting that information. It looks like it's a well-thought-out application and, and uh, uh, able to do things that... Uh, a lot of people only dream of doing. So, uh, Michael, I'd like to thank you again. Thanks for, for joining us. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us, uh, attending. We really hope you enjoy these uh, webinar series, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next ones. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. We really appreciate it. And uh, have a great day, great evening, wherever you might be uh, in your time of day. Uh, again, thank you for joining.